Okay, cool. I see the recording thing. Excellent. I'm excited. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about Christmas cinema and what is Christmas cinema without recognizing that it is fundamentally structured on 100 years of the most unrelenting Gothic terror that has ever been realized on the silver screen. Uh, you can find my Twitter, my website, which I'm still still working on it, still putting it together. So forgive forgive the clunkiness. Uh, my podcast, podcast Patreon, it's all there on the right. But uh, fortunately, Sam already linked to all of that. Um, yeah, that's 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 it as way of an intro goes. So let's uh, let's get spooky. Oh, a little Christmas magic in our transitions today. So he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. This is this is the fundamental. Uh, uh, you know, like children's rhyme for Santa Claus. Santa Claus is coming to town. What, what rests under the surface though is, is incredibly terrifying. He sees you when he's, you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Santa Claus is all seeing, all judging, and it implicitly starts with a threat to your physical well being, right? Be good for goodness sake. We don't know what lies underneath that threat. So what, what we have here is I think the best, the best way to frame everything, the best way to start this before we even really start talking about Christmas cinema and history and theories is just to, is just to watch a piece of Christmas horror. Uh, this was broadcast on cable TV, I think in the UK in 75, right? This is, this is a, a gentleman who had a local spooky rendition of Santa Claus is coming to town and he decided to, for some reason, that is really good for me to share it with the world. So here we go. You better watch out, you better not cry, you'd better be good, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list, he's checking it twice, he's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. <laughs> you better watch out. You better not cry. You'd better be good. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, that gets me every time. The ho, ho, ho right at the end is just, it's, it's worth its weight in gold. It's a little miracle. So there, there's a lot going on in this that I think it's worth, it's worth more than just having a bit of fun with, right? From, from a filmmaking perspective, this is, this is brilliant. And a lot, of, a lot of cable TV stuff, like, sure, the budget's terrible and you gotta, you gotta adjust for that when you're grading, but like the double exposure, the kind of weird coloration of the, of the footage, this, this is unnerving, right? Like our, our, our reader of the poem, right? The narrator, he's spectral, he's floating over these children. And, you know, like obviously his reading has got spooky inflictions here and there, which I just absolutely love. Uh, but for me, the highlight comes at the end. It comes at that final moment, right? He, he has his ghoulish like, -hee 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 -hee. and the kid, the kids, are, they're a little spooked by that. But the thing that drives them over the edge is somebody, somebody off camera shouting, ho, ho, ho. The, the kids run at, at the, the coming of the Santa Claus. This, this, this is 75, right? This is before a uh, kind of mainstream Christmas horror, which is, which is decidedly camp and is full of slasher killers and monsters. This is, this is before all of that. The latent impulses of kind of Christmas horror cinema have, are, are, have always been there. They are part of the fabric of this holiday, as we will soon discuss. So what, uh, what horrors shall we learn today? What kind of dark arcane knowledge will be forever uh, scorched into the fabric of your being by the end of this lecture? So we're going to go through a brief, roughly 10,000 year history of cinema. Uh, I'm gonna wrap this up as quickly as I can, but there are 10,000 years of it to go through, surprisingly. Uh, we're gonna explore the genre through Yuletide terror. So we're going to reframe horror as if it were only a Christmas genre and try and find all of the highlights of horror cinema using nothing but Christmas movies. And then uh, we're gonna end today by discussing why Christmas of all holidays and why horror of all genres and see what is to be seen when we critically examine those two things. So you might be wondering why I'm talking about, 
Hang on, I gotta adjust the Zoom thing here. Uh, you might be wondering why we're talking about, you know, like ancient history and all of these historical elements when we wanna be talking about Christmas horror movies, which really don't kick off till at least the late 70s. And the best way to go about this is Utah Phillips. If you know me from the Horror Vanguard podcast, I will talk about Utah Phillips every chance I get. He's an American folk personality, American folk singer, labor activist, uh, all, all around wonderful gentleman. Also one of the many forbidden Santa Clauses we're gonna meet today. He's got very high Santa energy, but doesn't quite meet the cut. Uh, one of his best ideas that he talked about all the time was this idea of the long memory. And we have his quote here, the long memory is the most radical idea in this country. It is the loss of that long memory which deprives our people of that cognitive or that connective flow of thoughts and events that clarifies our vision. Not of where we're going, but of where we want to go. Part of the condition that we're living through today is that we've, we've had our memories severed from us. We're not as connected with our traditions, our past, our heritage, our cultures, the stories that we share. And rebuilding that connection can help us understand the world around us. And that includes things as fun and as seemingly trivial as Christmas horror movies. So that is why we're starting where we start today. So uh, we're gonna look at the ghosts of cinema past. We're gonna look at the things that would ultimately come together to become what we know as cinema today. Uh, some of these are naturally occurring phenomena out in nature. Others of these uh, likely happened before written language but they are the constitutive elements that will eventually lead us to decide that it's a really cool idea to put transparent slides in front of some kind of fire in order to project a picture that moves. And it all starts with the shadow graph. So the shadow graph is a physics phenomenon. It's a naturally occurring uh, uh, concept, right? So this occurs when an otherwise invisible thing would distort the air around it, refract light, and then cast a shadow. So the best example of this is this kind of uh, adorable drawing here. We have like a little cave guy and a little fire and we can see that the sun's behind us and the caveman is casting his own shadow onto the wall. And what he's looking at here is the shadow that's being cast by all of the gases rising up from the fire. These are invisible to cameras, these are invisible to the human eye, but they still distort and block light, which means they still cast shadows. So here we have something that's invisible that is casting a shadow. This is, this is kind of an optical illusion. It's a play that the light is making with the space around it, right? We don't have really any, or at least I'm not aware of any like actual anthropological evidence that suggests that cavemen gathered around and watched this for fun. But this is something that no doubt that they would have seen having lit a fire, right? You can see this on, on a hot day when a heat shimmer is casting a shadow. You can see this if you put a glass of water on a table in the sun, um, if the sun hits it right through the side, it will cast a shadow onto the table. The water itself will cast a shadow. So this is kind of the beginning of where we start to see light and shadow coming together to, to create this play, to distort our, tra our traditional and typical perceptions of the world around us. And shadows continue onward here for the horribly named shadow graphy. Uh, way too close to shadow graph uh, for my taste. Uh, shadow graphy is a fancy term for shadow puppetry. Um, shadow graphy has been around for thousands of years that we know of. It probably goes back before that, but before that we're running out of written language points. Um, shadow graphy is a fancy term for shadow puppets, right? You can remember those little rabbit hopping around, you'll cast a shadow of it. This would be a horrible rabbit. It's got like a horn and a fang. It's like a jackalope or something. Um, I am not a shadow graphy performer, so please forgive my crude examples. Um, but what kind of we see here is, is a way to play with light and shadow and perception that doesn't require a lot of technology. The only technology you need for shadow graphy is fire, right? Um, there are dedicated like lamps that project better shadow graphy if you're gonna be a professional about it, but you really just need fire. Um, shadow graphy dies as a phenomenon around the time that we get electricity and electric lighting in our homes, which coincidentally is around the time that cinema starts to get really popular. These two things become ubiquitous around the same time, which kills shadow graphy as an art form. Uh, you can try this tonight, or if it's night wherever you are now, just uh, turn off all the uh, turn off every all the lights except for one in your room, and try and use an electric light to cast a shadow and make a little jackalope. Or, or how was my jackalope? I, I don't even remember how I did it. Um, try and cast a jackalope. It's not going to work. Electric lighting is terrible for this. Um, but here are some examples, right? Here, here are all of the fun things. And this used to be 
a, a, an art form. People used to go see shadowgraphy shows, right? This would be worked into stage performances. This, this was a way of expressing a lot of the things that cinema just overshadows today. Over, overshadows, I'll take that pun. I did that intentionally, that was well-planned. Uh, so we also have uh, the uh, camera obscura, right? It's the first technical, it's the first uh, technical camera that we've got here. Um, this, like shadowgraphy and like shadowgraphs itself, we don't really know when the first camera obscura happened because camera obscura can be a natural phenomenon. You just need a hole in a surface projecting into a dark room to create this very rudimentary and basic camera. It's essentially a gigantic pinhole camera technology that's still used today. I've got one behind me on a shelf. Um, but the basic principle is you have a tiny hole in a dark room and then the light projected through that tiny hole will flip like it would in a camera lens and be project and the image will project onto the wall. You can find really cool viral articles about like people who went into attics that had been closed for years and there was just like a city, the cityscape projected onto the wall because like a, a squirrel or something had chewed a hole in the wall, creating a somewhat naturally occurring cinema obscura. You can also create these with fabric, right? You could do these with loose sheets of paper. You could do this with animal hide. It's, it's highly possible that the uh, camera obscura has existed for far longer than we know. And this is playing with the same principles that are going to later evolve to become cinema. All of these things come together and coalesce in what is cinema today. Along with a bunch of other stuff, stage magicians are hugely important for cinema. The like Melies, the Lumiere brothers, all of their tricks that they, that they did in front of the camera were originally stage magic. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that theater and literature are just a little bit important next to these random other things. So why this history, right? Why, why do we just spend all of that time talking about cave people staring at shadows when we want to talk about Christmas cinema? These are the, the core elements of cinema and they are not modern. The constitutive parts of the cinema that, that we enjoy today go back before written language, right? Our culture is, is, a, is a tapestry that is constantly being woven. It is, it is always in dialogue with the past. There's this contemporary modern uh, attitude, especially for cinema, to read it as a modern phenomenon. This, that, that this has never occurred before. And it's something entirely new to the modern age. When you know, we can find things that we would recognize as cinema adjacent as far back as the 1600s, right? That's, you had Phantasmagoria, you had Magic Lanterns, you had all these phenomena that are part of one long history that is constantly developing and changing and reaching the moment that we're at today. And not to make this too uh, like a, a teleology, it's not like, you know, shadowography didn't exist to create cinema, but it is part of a chain of events uh, that leads us to where we are today. I don't know if you, anyone here is very online, but it's that meme where the tiny hand is tipping a domino and it's a caveman looking at a firewall. And then there's the giant domino falling over and it's the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But these things are, are woven together. And in order to critique and understand cinema, we need to have this as our foundation. We need to recognize that this history isn't just a, a modern thing that popped out of nowhere, that it's woven into the fabric. And it also this is important because this is true for winter solstice celebrations, right? Uh, Christmas is not a modern phenomenon, although aspects of it are. Some aspects of Christmas are indeed ancient. Some aspects of Christmas, uh, you know, very well draw on pagan traditions in Europe, right? All of these things intersect. Christmas is also a holiday that's been sent around the world by colonialist forces, right? Christmas has gone around the world from cap due to capitalism and due to missionary work. All of these attempts to instantiate empire in all the corners of the globe carry Christmas with it. And this has also inflected local cultures into Christmas all over the place. The, the, the traditions of Christmas are, you know, vague, poorly defined and a little diaphanous because this holiday has become something global and is something ancient. So as cinema is developing from shadow puppets and magic lanterns into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, so too are cultural celebrations of a winter solstice, right? These are colliding as, as Christian forces spread into Europe. These are changing over histories and over times as cultures change, as tastes change, as traditions change, so too do the celebrations that happen around this time of year. Knowing how all of these things slot together 
we we can we can stop framing questions as if we are in a frozen moment in time on an island alone, just trying to figure out why Santa Claus is stabbing those teens. We can instead read it as this gigantic history, and find out how Santa Claus has gone from a saint to a figure in pagan religions to the guy on the Coca-Cola bottle. And so now we're gonna talk about the third Christmas movie. I'm gonna cheat and skip the first two. The very first Christmas movie is, it's like it's a minute and 36 seconds long. It's a short, Santa gives some presents to some kids. It looks so creepy if you watch it today, but that's because the film is over a hundred years old and we you know what got digitized and preserved was already pretty banged up. I'm sure in, it, in its day, it was heartwarming and wonderful, but now it is just this, this haunting text. But we're gonna to skip to the third Christmas movie. We're gonna, we're gonna cut ahead. The third Christmas movie is an adaptation of A Christmas Carol. It is a ghost story. The very third place people chose to go for Christmas is ghosts. And I know third feels a little arbitrary here, but that's incredibly close to the onset of something, right? This is, this is at the very cutting edge. This movie came out in 1901 when cinema hadn't quite solidified yet. It wasn't the massive force that it is today with movie tickets and theater houses in every town and gigantic international companies funding movies. Although that stuff was emerging as this was happening, it wasn't yet the de facto state of things. So this is when essentially all cinema was experimental. So we're gonna, we're gonna treat ourselves to two thirds of the third Christmas movie here. If it works, it works. So this is a silent film. <laughs> Not much to listen to here. Uh, this is, of course, a, a riff on A Christmas Carol. However, this particular version is not actually uh, an adaptation of A Christmas Carol. It's a little misleading. This is actually an adaptation of a contemporary play that was an adaptation of The Christmas Carol. They chose to chop out um, the three unnecessary ghosts and just leave it to the ghosts of Jacob Marley. They streamlined the plot. A lot of this is really ambitious. The special effects in this movie are, are wild for the time, which is just cutting edge stuff. As we're about to see in a second in an incredibly terrifying scene, if, if you're not okay with ghosts and ghouls, please avert your eyes. I can't, I can't, I can't bear to see that, that spectral face that pops out of the door. That special effect for its time is just so cutting edge, right? And the idea of doing this kind of movie was also cutting edge for its time, right? This, this was a movie adaptation of a book. Who would ever think of that? That's wild. So what we're seeing here is like all of these histories coalescing and coming together. Book adaptations are like the go-to today. Everybody's still hunting for the next Harry Potter franchise. But back when this was coming out, doing these kind of adaptations, maybe it was a little natural because you're working with a lot of theater actors, but like there were no rules. There were no establishments. The effect that we're also about to see blew people's minds. The ability to, to not only have this double exposure ghost coming through in a second, but to also have this entire area on the back matted out to show uh, what is Scrooge's past. He's, he's about to have uh, the ghost of Christmas past where he meets all of his failings. And we're just gonna watch the first second of this. And we see he's a boy and he's, he's studying too much and he doesn't like love and he's a horrible jerk because Scrooge is a horrible jerk. Um, I'm gonna fast forward through the stuff where we, where we go to the Cratchits and we see Tiny Tim, it's a little sad and it's a little not interesting. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna to go to the Christmas that might yet be. So this is, this is uh, the end of the movie for us. Uh, in, when this movie was released, it would have had another minute and a half, two minutes left. But the end of this film has been lost to time. This is about as far as it goes now. We, uh, we get to watch Scrooge uh, be really upset that he sees his own grave. And I think it's really telling that that is the moment that the time tide and event has given us for this film, right? We, we don't have the collected fullness through, through happenstance and chance. It just happens to end when Scrooge sees his grave. You know, it doesn't end on Tiny Tim. It doesn't end on a happy ending. It ends on death in the grave. So the first Christmas movie is forever locked into the most tragic part of uh, Dickens' classic tale there. All right, now we're gonna have a little intermission for the first Q&A session, if I can escape the Zoom thing.
Um, okay, cool. Let's uh, let's let's continue the fun. A little another little magic transition here. So now we're going to talk about genre, and in order to talk about genre, we really have to uh, talk about another French guy. It's very French guys in the chat today. So we're going to talk about Derrida now. Uh, this is from uh, his work, The Law of Genre. Every text participates in one or several genres. There is no genreless text. There is always a genre and genres. Yet such participation never amounts to belonging. And that I think is the really important thing here. The participation doesn't amount to belonging. Nothing, nothing is truly a single genre, right? Derrida here says that nothing is genreless, but the inverse of that is true. Nothing is one genre. Every, every film, every comic book, every, every story, every slash fic, whatever you read, it is multiple genres at the very least. And this is something that is kind of inexorable about fiction, but let's, let's take a Christmas look at, at some of the uh, typical genres of horror and see if we can't find them in Christmas movies. Uh, so first up, body horror. Uh, so body horror is one of the most extreme genres of, of horror cinema, right? The, the point of body horror is, is both to test the limits of, of emotion and the flesh, and also to test the limits of the audience, right? I think um, one thing that's, when you're talking about uh, horror cinema in particular, and we'll get onto this in a bit, but it's always really important to remember that you are part of the film, right? There's a physical experiential nature to horror cinema that demands you take part in it, that demands you participate in it. Body horror is this at its ultimate extreme, right? So in body horror, we see extreme mutilation, extreme sexual acts, extreme emotional acts. This is about pushing the envelope. You can think human centipede, you, you, the Saw movies are a very soft and easy to access example of body horror. Uh, New French Extremity is some of the hardest stuff, uh, Martyrs is a great example of a body horror film that isn't afraid to address the sexual and emotional elements as well. A very intense cinema. Uh, why are we watching a goofy snowman drive away in a car is probably what's playing in the back of your head right now. Uh, but this is, this is uh, the best uh, scene from the movie Jack Frost. And it, thank, thankfully some intrepid internet user transformed it into a gif for me. Um, but so the basic premise of Jack Frost is it's a week before Christmas. So this is this isn't a technically a Christmas horror movie. It is a literal Christmas horror movie. A serial killer is being transported to his execution. He's living out his last night. They're driving him away to go be murdered for his heinous and unforgivable crimes. When the vehicle that he's in collides with a truck transporting uh, experimental medical supplies, right? The truck is is hauling. DNA liquid that will, you know, high science, woo, like that's what's going on. Uh, uh, our killer gets washed in this, this kind of genetic soup and he falls into the snow. And naturally, if that were to happen to any one of us, we would turn into mutant snowmen, right? So we have this, we have an initial body horror element that feels more at home in the scene in Hellraiser where Frank is rising up from the goo except for in this case, it's a man rising up in the snow. His body has been dissolved back into a primeval element and now he must reconstitute himself. The rest of the movie focuses on the extreme disfiguring and transformation of his physical form. It's played off as jokes, but it is body horror nonetheless. We're seeing his physical features get moved around all the time, his head's rolling off, but he doesn't die because he's a snowman and they're immune to that kind of thing. And then we have the inverse of that too, right? He's still a serial killer and he's out to get revenge on the judge that put him away. And his, his murders aren't, he doesn't just, just knife people. You know, he's, he's, not, he's not a slasher, he's a monster. So in, in things that are probably more home in the movie, The Thing, um, which I saw a pseudo compelling argument that it's, a, that it's a Christmas movie because a bunch of bearded men give each other surprise gifts in a setting similar to an awkward family gathering. So I will, I'll take that, I'll accept it. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of kills in Jack Frost, which radiate with body horror energy. Probably the most iconic one is a woman gets into a bathtub full of water, which she believes to be just water, but it's actually the body of Jack Frost, right? He then, he then freezes and solidifies her amongst other things, right? So, so we, have, we have that same sexual extremity, that same extremity of gore, the same extremity of what happens to the human body, 
all playing out in a movie that has the scene we've been watching on loop for maybe the last five minutes or something. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take us away from Jack Frost and his, his fun car driving ways. So comedy horror is, is possibly one of the most interesting genres of horror because these are, these are ostensibly these are at odds, right? You can't really have horror and comedy together. Comedy wants you to laugh and be lighthearted. Horror wants you shivering and afraid. Um, this is the movie Anna and the Apocalypse. Anna and the Apocalypse is high school musical meets your zombie apocalypse movie meets Christmas cinema. It's all three of these things coming together. And yes, it is a musical. Uh, so during Anna and the Apocalypse, we've got both comedy and horror, right? There's, there's a scene where a, a zombie inside of a snowman gets his head knocked off with playground equipment, right? We have, we have both of these worlds existing simultaneously. And there's a lot in this that I think is, is, is really interesting, right? Um, first off, this is, this is the example par excellence of the, law, of the uh, arguments inside of Derrida's law of genre, right? What we have here is a text that refuses that by its very existence cannot ever be a single genre, right? Even if you uh, chose to read out the horror elements as all comedy or chose to read out all the horror element or all the comedy elements as just horror, you're still left to grapple with the musical. It's inexorable to the form that is Anna and the Apocalypse. So you have a movie that is actively participating in shuffle genres at once. And the generic participation that, that we're gonna be talking about is, is multimodal and very complex. And in, the <laughs> and in the Apocalypse might not be a very funny movie for you. You might just find this unrelentingly terrifying. On the other hand, you might not find it scary at all. It might just be a comedy for you. And that begs us to ask, which one is it? You know, this is, this is such a good movie for stressing the borders of what genres get to be and what genres are allowed to do, right? We use genres as uh, far too strict ways to categorize movies. We're too preoccupied with genre as a confining system instead of genre as a participatory descriptor. And the other thing I want to say about this is that on, on Horror Vanguard, which if you're a listener to the show, thank you. <laughs> um, one thing we always talk about is how horror wants to do things to your body, right? Horror is a fleshly form. This, this kind of mode of storytelling doesn't succeed unless it does something inside of you, inside your bones and the core of your being, right? In a way that certain other genres don't. Action doesn't really have that as part of its goal system. Action might get your blood pumping. Maybe you get nervous uh, at a particular action scene that's really intense for you. Um, but that's not, that's not the goal of action isn't to make you nervous. The goal of action is to wow you with spectacle and, and physical performance and violence. Um, horror has a physical goal. It wants to change something inside of your body, right? When you, when you, when you jump to a jump scare, that, that, that's a reaction inside of your body. That's speaking to some primal part of your brain that's demanding that you respond to something that might threaten you. It's skipping all those cognitive layers that would go, oh yes, that big explosion is good because I have, I'm a big explosions guy. It's cutting right to the core. Comedy does the same thing. Comedy demands a physical response from your body, right? It wants you to, to keel over laughing and to giggle, to chuckle. These, these things aren't mediated by our complicated thought processes. Even if we wanna talk about how action movies maybe aren't so complicated sometimes, like comedy wants to reach in deep with you and grab something. And so horror and comedy naturally fuse together. These, these things are naturally found together. They're partners, which is why a bad horror movie turns into a comedy. Uh, a horror movie that's missing its beats, that's not so scary anymore, is going to get really funny. It's funny when you can see the zipper on the costume. You know, it's, it's funny when the jump scares are poorly timed. It's funny when you can like shout at the characters for like constantly making horrible decisions, like running back into the haunted house and all that stuff. Like these, these two forms exist as one. If you, we can treat them as an identical genre if we look at them from the perspective of what they're trying to do to us, the audience. And all of this comes from a post high school musical, uh, you know, little piece of cinema there. Moving on, <laughs> sorry, I got winded going on my like horror does things to your body rant. All right, so now we're gonna talk about folk horror. And I am gonna spend forever talking about folk horror because this is, is so important to what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of our lives. <laughs> um, so Christmas folk horror 
is literally every single Christmas horror movie you've ever seen, they are all folk horror. None of them escape this. Every single Christmas movie, every single Christmas horror movie rather, um, I'd have to, yeah, probably every single Christmas movie too, but especially every single Christmas horror movie is a folk horror movie. Um, and there's no better place to see this than the revival of the Krampus, right? So the Krampus is a Germanic uh, evil Santa Claus friend, right? So Santa Claus just doesn't travel with a bunch of chill reindeer and some helpful elves. Santa also travels with a bunch of really bad dudes who are out to cause havoc. Krampus is one of them. Krampus will uh, uh, kidnap little kids. He'll whip them with a switch. He's, he's, the, he's the corrective to Santa's giving kindness. And there's figures like this all throughout folklore, right? Um, it's one, one of the um, Nordic countries. There is a, if I'm getting this right, there's a, uh, uh, an evil cat that travels with Santa and this cat will kidnap bad children. It's essentially its job. Um, and there's also a goat man which goes around homes and it'll either give you presents or it'll, it'll, it'll terrorize you. There are all kinds of figures like this that, that do, that either travel with Santa or that do Santa related things, but they're, they're kind of spooky. They're not as friendly as, you know, our big jolly old elf guy. Uh, Krampus is a 2015 movie. That's kind of a send up to eighties horror. It's very camp, it's very fun, um, but it is a folk horror movie. It is drawing out folk traditions that are kind of getting lost to the ether, right? You know, really nobody was talking about Krampus before this movie comes out. You know, you probably would have found it in like, oh, like weird listicle, uh, like 10 Christmas monsters you didn't know exist. Or maybe if you were like a Germanic studies student or a folklorist or something, you would have known of the Krampus and these other figures. But now they're all being forced to the forefront. You can find Krampus Christmas ornaments, Krampus sweaters, Krampus costumes. You know, we have Krampus fever, there are Krampus candy canes. Krampus is in style right now. There's never been a better time to be a Krampus than today. And what this kind of speaks to is, it asks us a question, it's kind of asking us a question about what folk is. Because we tend to imprison folk in the past. Folk is something that happened and stopped happening at some point when we became modern. Right, we, you know, our grandparents had folk beliefs and folk practices. Today, we, do, we don't have those things. We have modern stuff. Uh, the, the enduring undefeatability of Christmas horror is a folk tradition that's still alive and well today. Santa Claus is a folk figure. The revival of Krampus are folk figures. Christmas is a folk holiday, right? Like the, the set of Christmas practices very widely wherever you are in the world, you know, even, um, what, you know, and the good thing to keep in mind here is that, you know, Christmas, obviously, you know, like uh, part of its shell is being a Christian holiday, you know, celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ for that religion. But all the other chunks of Christmas are these secular, folkloric, old pagan things coming in from other cultures. Christmas is a constellation of belief systems and attitudes and traditions and time that is still active and alive today. And this reminds us that folk is not uh, a, a noun, it's a verb. Folk is something that we do and are doing. Folk is a contested space. We're constantly arguing what gets counted in the folk canon, what doesn't, what is folk, what isn't, what gets to participate inside of a folk framework and what doesn't get to participate there, right? Uh, 50 years from now, uh, the, the next generation, Grandpa Ash, he was a folk guy. He did those folksy things all the time, you know, things we won't think about ourselves, future generations will, because we are still recontextualizing and arguing what folk is through our actions, through our beliefs, through what we do every day, right? Folk, if we're losing connection to folk, it's because we're losing connection to each other, right? Because we're becoming more alienated, we're losing common space. Like those are the areas where folk thrives and those things are harder and harder to find, right? Copyright law goes for an eternity right now. And one of the reasons we have this rich tradition of Christmas horror movies is that no one has the copyright on Santa Claus. You know, any one of us could go make a Santa Claus movie. Also, no one has the copyright on Krampus because it's a mythological being, you know, but like no, uh, the Disney has the copyright on Darth Vader. So if you want to make any Darth Vader anything, you have to go through some very official and expensive channels. Um, and like the kind of way I want to wrap up the Christmas folk tradition, because I could do this all night, um, is that like back to the idea of like, 
Krampus, Krampus was a lost folk thing, especially here in the States. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of Krampus going around here. Now you can just get Krampus anything whenever you want, right? This folk space has been revitalized through mass interest. If this movie would have flopped and been really poorly made and everyone would have hated it, the kind of the spur inside of the folk tradition might not have stuck. Click. All right, we're gonna watch another movie. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about found footage horror. This was by far the single most challenging thing to find a Christmas example of. Um, but I found one and it's, it's really awesomely bad. So I'm going to just prime you with that. Um, but before, before we have our candy, we have to have our vegetables. Um, it's probably a way no one has ever phrased that in human history. <laughs> uh, but first, uh, 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 Christmas or found footage is goth at, at its core. This is the gothic way to tell a story. Because what is found footage? More broadly, it is found text. And the found text tradition is the, is the fundamental core of Gothic cinema. Sorry, let me see if I can make myself a little brighter. That's how dark I'm getting, okay. Um, so found text is like the core of Gothic cinema, right? Or Gothic uh, storytelling more broadly, right? I know this is a, is a little hack to bring up uh, the Castle of Otranto during anything Gothic studies because everyone does that. And everyone at some point we are like, we, we swear a secret oath in the Gothic studies cabal that we must mention the castle of Otranto once per Gothic discussion or we lose goth points. Um, I, I'll, lose, I'll lose the ability to summon bats if I don't bring this up. And also I have, I have the publication date for the castle of Otranto tattooed on my thumbs. So personal favorite of mine. But that story is a piece of found text, right? It opens with this premise that effectively says, hey guys, I found this really scary story. You're not gonna believe the kind of stuff going on in here. Why don't you read it? And there's something about that that's deeply compelling and so compelling that a lot of Gothic fiction would go on to do that, right? We can find this in Dracula, we can find this in Frankenstein. You know, like Dracula is an epistolary mode. It's telling us its story through letters and diary entries and ship manifests, right? When you get a copy of Dracula in hand, it's not that you're getting a book in the same way that you would get like Narnia right, where it's, where it's just a collective bound fiction and chapters, you're getting a, a shift of, of different texts and stories and people's writing bound together to try and tell you someone's narrative. This tradition would go on to become found footage horror. It's the exact same thing, the exact same impulse that Horace Walpole had when he says like, woo, I found this spooky story, is, this, is the same impulse behind, we found these Blair Witch tapes out in the woods, why don't you check them out? And I think this, this speaks to the enduring power of found footage as, as a storytelling format. And it also takes us back to that folk conversation, right? We're in the golden age of found footage. There has never been a better time to be a found footage filmmaker, horror or otherwise, right? If you own a smartphone, you already have all of the requisite technology to make the next absolute banger of a found footage movie. You can get millions of views on YouTube, but you could, you could even get a Hollywood deal if your found footage movie is, is picked up by someone. And this is because the technology that's required to make found footage has a much, much, much lower bar. It's much more accessible, which brings it into the folk sphere. You know, like the space between a proper found footage movie being released by a studio and a bunch of YouTubers filming scary pranks for each other starts to collapse. And I think that's a good framework uh, to, to watch this. We're gonna skip around this a bit because it is a bit long, uh, but let's uh, see if it starts playing here. Oh, hang on, get it again. There we go. Okay. So this is, um, some YouTuber made this, it's got like 1.6 million views or something and it's called, I found evil Santa in the woods, exclamation point, open parentheses, he chased me, close parentheses. Um, this guy's whole channel is stuff like this. It's like, as you can see in the, um, the, the bottom, the more videos, he's got like an, I, I got chased by a slender man and like, oh, he's, he's got like at least like 20 videos that I saw where he like encounters it, the Stephen King clown and there's like a red balloon floating in the background or something. So that's like, it's a shtick. Um, but I think this one, this one is really interesting for what we're talking about today.
classic found footage opening right there, explaining where we found this footage. What's going on, guys? Infinite lists here, so back is, with is, another his, video his now. Setup. He'll let us know where the footage was found, you know, and then he'll do his like YouTuber opening to try and draw you in. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna skip ahead to the good stuff though, uh, and watch him get attacked by monsters. <clears throat> um, no, what was that? What? There should be no one out here. This I'm in the middle of the woods, dude. Yo, <gasps> bro. <gasps> oh my gosh, no. Yo. Yo, that is the creepiest thing ever. Oh my god. Yo, I'm out. I. Are you kidding? Already? Uh, so, so he is surprised. He's already being beset by by this woodland monster. Um, throughout the movie, he'll 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 find a trail of kind of forbidden presence. Um, that he has to that he, that he opens and explores, and we're just gonna we're just gonna cut to the gory end and see what happens to our intrepid YouTuber here. Dude, there's nothing in here. <gasps> uh, so he he gets got by the literal Krampus from the Krampus movie. Someone in a Krampus costume finds him, which uh, it's great. I love it. But this is such a cool example of a found footage horror movie, right? I don't know what he was shooting this on. Um, he's, he seems to be a successful YouTuber, which leads me to assume that he's probably shooting it on some kind of like DSLR camera with like a little mic on the top of it, you know, something like a Canon 60 Mark II with a Rode mic on it. And that, like even that, like that setup would cost you like maybe six or $700 American, something like that. But you could also shoot this on an iPhone. Right, if, if I'm being honest, the kind of thing he's filming right here, you can film this on the cost of this phone you already have, right? So we have this Gothic tradition that, that starts in the 1700s and goes to today with people finding text and trying to convince you that the footage that they found is somehow legitimate. And we conveniently have a Christmas example of that. Um, so going on to, to the little teaser that you probably already saw, we have a uh, gothic Christmas horror. So goth is a difficult genre to pin down um, because it's not in any one place. Um, if you're fans of gothic literature, especially the older stuff, uh, you'll know that it's a total mess as to what gets to count as gothic and what doesn't. Um, but we have some people who write stories that are uh, spooky and about ghosts and personal drama and other people who are like really into demons and gore and depravity. And on the kind of other end of that spectrum, we have like high society romance drama. So, so when you open up the Gothic, you kind of, you can, it's a grab bag. You get anything from de demonic possession and murder all the way to, oh, who is Lord such and such taking to the ball. We have like this whole spectrum of wonder set before us. And that makes it really hard but also really easy. It's, it's this cool little double bind we wind up in, right? It makes the Gothic such a fun genre because it, it's, it's hard to market, right? Like if, if I told you that the movie was goth and you assumed that it was a Marilyn Manson-esque film and, or you assumed that it was like, uh, you know, Mr. Darcy's Adventures, or you assumed that it was someone in a castle in the 1500s being chased around by a haunted suit of armor, all of those assumptions would be simultaneously correct. Uh, this, this leads us to some cool places for the Gothic as a, a generic mode, because it can engage and participate in itself and in these all of these wild expressions internally, right? And this makes it really, really, really hard uh, for the Gothic to become a cinematic genre, because in, in kind of contemporary society, the thing that drives cinematic genre is what's going to sell and how can you shelve things? The best example of this is Guillermo del Toro's Crimson Peak. Phenomenal movie. It's a gothic romance set in an old spooky mansion. It's full of ghosts. It's great, but it flopped. It was, it was kind of a theatric failure and that's because studios didn't know how to market it. They didn't know how to cut the trailers. And so they didn't know what movie they were dealing with because what is a gothic romance? You know, especially, especially in um, you know, like contemporary cinema a romance movie is very clear cut what that's gonna be. 
and the bulk of romance comment that, that's coming or content is coming out from like Mara Vista films and up being uploaded straight to Amazon Prime Video or something. You know, like that's not a, not a cinematic genre as much anymore. And Gothic, Gothic just doesn't exist as a film genre. Like there's no, if you went to the Gothic uh, shelf at a film store, you could find everything from like a Halloween to a rom-com. It would just be like uh, too, too diverse to pin down. And, and on top of all of this, there's kind of, there's kind of no arbiter of goth, right? There's no, there's no goth taste maker that gets to pin the genre in part because it's so old and it diversified so quickly that, that there was never a, a lone defensible canon uh, in terms of style and content. And like, even in Gothic studies, there was so much discussion about what even is a formalistic definition of the Gothic and how you can go from nothing to building up that formalistic definition. So what this kind of tethers us into is that Derrida quote that I read a bit ago, right? You're participating in genre, but it's not even so much you're participating in the genre, you're participating in the act of participation. Um, and this is a, a weird academic phraseology I've got going on here. So forgive that if you would, but we are talking about Derrida. So I kind of have to make it complicated and weird. But what I mean to say is that it's not so much that a movie just participates in being a horror movie while also participating in being an action movie. Halloween is a great example of this. It's part horror in the sense that you've got like this uh, half natural slasher taking out teenagers. It's also kind of part action, right? You've got a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. You've got cops shooting at stuff. You've got like all this kind of, uh, like the violence bleeds into this action realm really nicely. So it's participating in the action genre but it's more so engaged in the act of participation in that genre. And the Gothic is a great example of this because the Gothic isn't so solidified. The Gothic is all about participation. It's all about what part of the Gothic are you going to be participating in, right? What areas are you going to be most concerned with and most engaged with? And the same is true for horror. You know, participating in the horror genre isn't as cut and dry as just saying horror. You know, we have a lot that can be picked apart here. We have like, is the audience being cooperative? Are they being scared along with the movie as the movie's suggesting? If they're not, does it, does it even get to count as horror anymore? And like, what if we watched uh, a horror classic of yesterday? What if we watched like um, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon is a great example. Like that, I'm hard pressed to believe that that would scare a modern audience in the theaters. You know, it's a, it's a guy in a costume running around chasing people. It loses a lot of its teeth just from how used to it we've gotten, right? It's a Scooby-Doo bad guy at this point. But like, that's still a kind of horror you can participate in, right? Like this thing is so diverse. It's about the actions you're committing as a text. And to this end, we have It's a Wonderful Life. Christmas classic. So uh, uh, fun It's a Wonderful Life fact. Uh, the year it came out, it was critically panned. And nobody liked it, total flop. But thanks to that happening, it kind of fell, it fell away. Studios, studios didn't track the rights to it. They kind of lost it. And then it went into the public domain. And the second it hit the public domain, every, every studio from NBC to the BBC was airing this thing all day and night during the holiday season because it didn't cost them a dime. And this was the birth of this Christmas movie becoming a classic, but this is also probably the single best example of a Gothic horror piece inside of, inside of Christmas cinema. Uh, forgiving Charles Dickens's ghosts, but we've already talked about those. So we have to throw in another movie here. Um, this movie is about a man who his entire life is a series of unfortunate sacrifices he makes to help others. All the way um, from his childhood to his adulthood, he is constantly giving up little parts of himself to stabilize the community around him. Um, this culminates um, at, at a point in his adult life where he, he fails. Um, he, he accidentally loses a bunch of money. His company is about to fold. His company is the only thing keeping their town from being absorbed by this uh, evil corporate guy's gigantic uh, mega corporation. He goes to kill himself. And at that, at that moment, he's, he's saved by an angel, but not saved in some kind of trite, really, uh, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? you know, kind of like, like an overtly nostalgic saccharine kind of saving. He is sent to an alternate reality wherein he was never born and forced to witness the horrors of, of what if he was never there to do these minor good deeds throughout his life. It is an incredibly dark movie at that point, right? It, it enters like this labyrinthine Gothic space. 
where in the movie is just asking us like, okay, like you might think you're a minor character in the world around you, right? Because um, he's contrasted with his brother a lot in the movie and his brother is a World War II hero, right? Saved people's lives uh, by being a daring pilot, right? The kind of hero that they make movies about. George Bailey, our protagonist is not that kind of hero. You know, he's doing very minor good deeds all the time. But as it turns out, without those minor good deeds, the whole world goes to hell. <laughs> And so like, it's got, that, it's got that gothic connectivity. It's got that gothic flow, right? It's, it's got strong Castle of Otranto vibes, right? We, we have divine intervention manifesting in a really horrific way. We have, we have a lot of emotional tension and drama. We've got a romance that builds and falls back and builds again. It's participating with and engaging with all of these disparate elements inside of the like, greater gothic canon. And moving on. <laughs> Oh, so now we got the Christmas slasher, which is another great example of uh, Christmas movies inside of uh, other, other genres of cinema. Black Christmas, it's worth pointing out, is one of the founding movies that gets to define what the slasher is. Prior to uh, Black Christmas and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, slasher wasn't a genre, right? You know, you, you didn't go, go to see a slasher movie. It just, it just wasn't available. It hadn't coalesced yet as its own form. So what we have here is we have a Christmas movie that winds up being uh, one of the forces that allows these generic forms to solidify. And this is 100% a Christmas movie. Like just look at the poster here. We have the season's greetings with the wreath and the bow. It's very open with its identity as a Christmas film. It's not trying to shy away from that or hide from it at all. Um, one other thing that's going on with this movie that I find to be really interesting is the content of this film, right? Slashers are so interested with space and how that space is mediated. In this Christmas slasher, we see um, the season of the holiday, or the holiday season rather, and how that operates, right? So during the Christmas season, there's so much going on that doesn't fall into our popular narrative for Christmas. What falls into the popular narrative is uh, families coming together, giving, forgiveness, like all, all of these things that would be in a Hallmark Christmas movie, they do not show up <laughs> in this film. Um, this, is, this is a movie that is really prescient for 2020 because 2020 is a year where it, many of us in many places of the world are, are experiencing the inverse Christmas, right? Black Christmas is about a bunch of sorority uh, girls who don't go home for Christmas. For various reasons, they're unable to, or there's no home to go to. They have to stay at the sorority house over the holidays. And that leaves them open to kind of the horrific condition that they're going to be facing. And I think that it's really interesting for me that this movie mediates on the season here. It's reflecting on those people that get left behind and the conversations that we're reluctant to have around Christmas. And it's doing that through the vehicle of slasher cinema. Uh, so here we have, we have a couple of the really, sorry, it's like a void, I'm in the void right now. I'm just like a disembodied spirit. It's so dark. Um, <clears throat> but so we're just gonna, we're just gonna fire off a bunch of Christmas movies right now that, that I think are all really interesting and, and worthy of their own discursive avenues. We've got Mrs. Claus, the rare uh, Christmas movie in general that focuses on Santa's unspoken uh, female partner. Christmas Evil, um, the, the baddest Santa that has ever lived, another Christmas slasher film. Santa's Slay starring Goldberg the Wrestler, right? This is a movie, the basic, so Goldberg, a wrestler, plays Santa Claus. But in this universe, Santa Claus is actually the son of Satan. And 2000 years ago, an angel tricked him into losing a game of curling. And upon losing the game, uh, the wager was that for 2000 years, he would do good deeds every Christmas and he could never again do evil ones. Um, and it turns out that the year this movie comes out, 2,000 years is up and he can be evil again until the, the townspeople band together to stop him. <clears throat> it's also incredibly camp. He does kill someone with an icicle. It is incredible. <clears throat> and we've got gremlins. You know, we can't, we can't talk about Christmas horror cinema without talking about gremlins. There is so much going on in gremlins. This movie is the movie that keeps on giving if you're into discourse, right? This, there is just like an infinite well of things inside of this film. Um, 
there is like anti-colonialist discourse, there's anti-capitalist discourse. <clears throat> the gremlins like aren't, aren't afraid to talk about um, how America has lost its like connection to industry and commodity fetishism. Right, this movie is so engaged with, with it's also about invasive species and the eco-gothic. Really, there, there is no limit to this movie and, and to what it wants to talk about. Moving on. We have Elves, um, another, another little movie uh, starring Dan Haggerty. And no, they're not working for Santa anymore. The Elves and Elves are a, a Nazi eugenics science experiment designed to create elves that will then breed with humans and will then create a master race. It's, it's a Christmas movie that also is unfortunately very contemporary for 2020. But it's, it's, it's great to examine the depth of just how weird Christmas horror as a genre gets and just what it's capable of tackling, right? There aren't Easter horror movies that are going where Elves is going. So the, the ubiquity of Christmas, the folk traditions that we're playing with here, allow us to, to have a wider spread of things that, um, and then we have Silent Night, Deadly Night, one of the classics. If, if you're into like Freud and psychosexual tension, this is the Christmas movie for you. It's, it's amazing, it's very strange, it's got nuns. Uh, the sequel is famous for just recycling footage from the original besides the phrase garbage day. So classic cinema there. And our next movie, um, this is the reason I'm in the dark because I have to hide from our next film. Our next film is something so, so wicked, so insidious and so evil that I, I debated about whether or not I was gonna put it in these slides. It's, it's a movie that quite frankly, I, I'm ashamed for listing here because it brings such wickedness wherever it goes. It is Santa Jaws. The sci-fi direct-to-video shark movie that is a Christmas movie. <clears throat> and as silly as this is, and it is very silly, it's good to, to realize just how far this has spread. Right underneath this, we've got a movie about Nazi eugenics elves, psychosexual nunnery tension, you know, eco-gothic Christmas gremlins. The Christmas uh, horror genre is as wide and as deep as the horror genre itself. And this brings us to our next intermission. On, onward and upward and through, through word. Uh, so we're gonna go to our next forbidden Santa Claus, Slavoj Žižek. Uh, Žižek is wrong about a lot of things, uh, but about cinema, he is very not wrong. Uh, so I think it's instructive uh, to approach the critique of cinema with uh, this, this quote in mind here. Um, and this is from his, his just beautifully titled The Pervert's Guide to Cinema. So just art here, sheer brilliance. In order to understand today's world, we need cinema, literally. It's only in cinema that we get that, that, it's only cinema we get that crucial dimension, which we are not ready to confront in our reality. If you are looking for what is in reality, more real than reality itself, look into cinematic fiction. Which, begs, which brings us to the question, why Christmas? Right? Why this holiday? Why not some other holiday? Why not Easter? Why not Thanksgiving? Although there are Easter horror movies, there are there is Thanks Killing, the Thanksgiving horror movie about a killer turkey. Um, you know, like there are, there are uh, Leprechaun horror movies that are great for St. Patrick's Day. There are Fourth of July horror movies. There are horror movies for April Fool's Day, but nothing has the bite that Christmas has, and nothing is getting and no holiday besides. Maybe Halloween, but maybe not even Halloween is getting the same kind of horror movie treatment as Christmas. And in order to kind of talk about why, <laughs> why this is happening, why Santa Claus is hanging out with the devil. Um, as a sidebar, um, I didn't have the time to talk about it, but there's a bunch of great horror movies where the premise is Santa has to fight Satan. And they're all really old and they're all really camp and weird and goofy. And I highly recommend checking them out. Um, but in order to enter into this conversation, we need to first ask what it means or what it means to find meaning in art. What are we attempting to do when we critique a movie or a painting or a song or a story or really anything? Um, 
And this is, this is a little quote that I think really helps for that. Uh, this is from Evan Calder Williams's book, Combined and Uneven Apocalypse. And in this, he's talking about the zombie movie, right? He's talking about that uh, Dawn of the Dead, right? You know, he's talking about zombies, uh, reading the zombie cinema, so the zombies are consumers and they're consuming everything and they're going to the mall because it's what they did in life. And, and that, that by its reflection means that we are the good consumers who know how to consume responsibly and we're not like them. And to that he says, fair enough. None of this is wrong per se and many of the films themselves court these interpretations. Nevertheless, these readings about the real content of zombies are limited because they aren't really readings. They just describe what happens in the films. And you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a movie critic, this is something I've definitely fallen into. This is a trap. There's a trap to just sum down the manifest content of a movie into just that surface level, to just talk about what is happening on the screen without actually interpreting it, without reading it and challenging it and tying it together, right? It's just, it's just taking it for granted that, that a movie is about what the movie tells us it's about. But to, to draw us back to that Zizek conf, uh, uh, quote, it's, it's about more than that. This is the reality more than real. So the movie must then be depicting something deeper, right? And this also ties us back to that Utah Phillips quote from the top of the show. This is about reconstituting a long memory. A long memory is capable of achieving like such strange manipulations of the information it holds because it remembers the totality of its past. So what, what does that mean for Santa Jaws? Uh, what, so Christmas, Christmas movies are giving us gifts, right? They're, they're giving us little horrific presents that we can unwrap, that can, that can say something about the world around us, that we can try and interpret, that we can build, that we can twist. So let's, let's, do, let's do something weird. Let's get weird with some horror movies. Let's get weird with some Christmas cinema. Instead of just doing some surface level critiques that deal with the manifest content, the surface level of these movies, let's, let's go into them and see what happens to us when we do that. So let's talk about domestic labor, right? Let, let, I think this is a really interesting uh, venue to talk about with Christmas cinema in general, uh, because what is one of the founding and unspoken elements of the Santa Claus myth? It's that he has a dutiful housewife who never leaves the home and ostensibly is taking care of everything back at the shop while he's gallivanting and giving away presents and getting all the attention. And in order to, to, to read this critique, I think it's, uh, it's good to read some Sylvia Federici, right? Sylvia Federici, great writer. Uh, um, if you wanna check out one of her books, I recommend uh, Counter Planning from the Kitchen and Caliban and the Witch would be my two. Uh, but of, of related topics and wages against housework, Sylvia writes, the unwaged condition of housework has been the most powerful weapon in reinforcing the common assumption that housework is not work. And this, this makes me want to ask questions about a lot of Christmas horror movies, right? Uh, because outside of very few examples, um, and in the examples I can think of, Santa Claus is forced to kill Mrs. Claus, right? Mrs. Claus is a non-existent, yeah, that's my reaction too. But um, Mrs. Claus is kind of a non-existent feature in a lot of horror movies. She's unspoken. And in the Santa Claus mythology, at least as it's contemporarily received today, Mrs. Claus is a homemaker of sorts who has no goals, dreams, ambition, or direction. And this is playing into larger cultural conversations that, that deal with uh, feminism and work that is traditionally seen as women's labor, right? Household work, the cooking, the cleaning, the washing up, child rearing, right? Jobs that if you did them outside of the home context um, and jobs, especially if you did them in, in like masculine context, you know, you, you would be a chef, you would be a therapist, you would be an educator, you would be a, a janitorial uh, staff member, right? You, you would, you, your work would actually be work with a capital W on it. <clears throat> and this also applies to Black Christmas, right? And a lot of uh, Christmas horror movies deal with domesticity. They deal with the domestic sphere uh, because Christmas is something that's supposed to happen with your family and in your home. Right, Santa Claus is supposed to come to you in, in wherever you live, right, and to your family. So we're entering into the domestic space when we have all these movies and films like Black Christmas and even the new Black Christmas remake, which is really good, <laughs> despite what I think every other living human would have to say, it's a really good movie. <laughs> but um, like Black Christmas uh, takes us into this kind of quasi-domestic space, right? It's a sorority house, right? It's a girl's dormitory kind of thing. 
and in that space is is only women's labor is only domesticity by the nature of a sorority right <clears throat> and we even have this kind of like old uh, matronly figure that looks after the girls and does things for them who has her own subplot that runs through the movie and it's and it's her coping with dealing with these rich little brats who live in her sorority house and I think that we can find this these kind of thematics occurring in so many horror movies Krampus is another great example of this right the Krampus film uh, uh, that came out, the big one that came out a few years ago, is literally about a family being imprisoned in their home, right? It's 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 the it's the family becoming an imprisoning unit, and I think that these are these are ways of exploring Christmas horror cinema that allow us to make these texts so much weirder than they ever wanted to be. Moving on. We've got to talk about Mark Fisher's weird and eerie really quickly because we have to. It is it is it is law. Um, so Mark Fisher defines the weird here with a capital W uh, as it involves a sensation of wrongness. The weird is an entity or an object so strange that it should not exist, or at least it should not exist here. Uh, Christmas is incredibly weird on, on, on like every level. Like what we were talking about a second ago in the Q&A, I think is so important here and is indeed what I wanted to bring up here. Right? Santa Claus should not exist, or at least he should not exist here is kind of a problem we get at with this figure, right? <clears throat> um, like I was saying in the Q&A, right? Like if, 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 a, if a grown man with a scraggly beard approached you on the street, especially a grown man wearing all red for some reason, and he, and he was like, hey, uh, your, do your kids like Legos? What if, I, what if I brought your kids some Legos? Would you give me some treats for that? Would, would that be all right with you? Like that is so unsettling. That is so weird because it shouldn't be. But like Santa's also supposed to be like the good guy, right? He's supposed to be an embodiment of pure, you know, jovial kindness and generosity. And so all of these Christmas horror movies are kind of demanding we answer the question how we've reached this point as a society where, where the pure act of giving is so, is so untrustworthy that, that this, this, this figure who's, who's the, the mythical embodiment of free giving and kindness has become this being of total suspicion. Uh, and another Mark Fisher quote here, this is, uh, so he defines the eerie as the eerie by contrast is constituted by a failure of absence or by a failure of presence. The sensation of the eerie occurs when either when there is something present when there should be nothing or there is nothing present when there should be something. This is running down to Christmas in the morning and there are no presents, but there is a snake monster devouring all of the presents around you, right? This is going up into the attic and finding the toys uh, uh, that you're supposed to be playing with here on Christmas Day have mutated into giant body horror demons who are now eating you and your family. Uh, this is this is the uh, thing that something is present when there should be nothing, right? You know, this is the the Santa Claus who is in fact a monster, right? There should be no monstrosity present in Santa Claus. And this is kind of what I mean by trying to challenge these movies and trying to let these movies possess you for a very gothic way to phrase this, right? You know, it's not just about, okay, what's in the text of the film. It's about what's in me as part of the text of the film. It's about what's in society as part of the context for which this film is in. If the movie is trying to tell you something, we need to ask why is it trying to tell us this and how is it trying to tell us this? Uh, and so as a, way, as a way to round this out, we're going to talk about Rise of the Guardians and uh, Santa and the State, right? So uh, one, of, one of the classic ways of reading horror in the Gothic is through contemporary anxiety, right? Uh, so we're going to look at NORAD. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a branch of the United States military. And what we're looking at here is their Santa tracker. The Santa tracker has been going on for decades now. <clears throat> and every, every Christmas, you can track Santa Claus's activities thanks to uh, the state apparatus and the Pentagon. Uh, so they're not all just about bombing weddings and children's assemblies. They're also about making sure that we know where Santa Claus is at every moment of the day. There's a lot that we can pick apart in this map. Uh, you know, we see here all these presents scattered throughout the globe, right? eerily resembling the distribution of American military bases throughout the world. <clears throat> you see all of these cameras designed to, to lull us in by, oh, they're just looking out for Santa, but really this is a surveillance state. 
you're always being filmed. You're always on camera. You're always being watched. You're always in public now. It's the reality of what we're looking here. If we can track mythological beings like Santa Claus, you bet we can track normal people. <clears throat> and this also instantiates and normalizes these attitudes, right? I watched this as a kid. It's perfectly normal for the military to constantly tell you where mythical beings are and to flex like that. But we can we can take this and like, okay, like this is a real world thing. This, this is not a movie. This is something that the government really does. Um, I mean, not literally track Santa Claus because it's Santa Claus, but this is the thing that they literally put into the world. I'm coming out as a Santa truther at the end of this conversation. Um, but, but let's turn to Santa cinema and kind of see what this is doing to these movies, right? So a, a trend that I've noticed in Santa related cinema and not necessarily always horror, which is where Rise of the Guardians comes into this, is that like, <clears throat> Santa Claus and a lot of mythical figures have been consumed into like the military industrial complex <clears throat> and Santa is no longer just a jolly gift giver who is sometimes also a demon depending on your cultural background and the mythologies we're working with here he's he's now kind of a one-man military right there are there are so many modern Santa horror movies where, where Santa is a soldier fighting on the front lines of a war against the Krampus you know, there's Rise of the Guardians, which like, you know, like it's, it's interesting to me that Guardian, to, was it today or yesterday? It was just announced that Guardians is the official name for soldiers in the American Space Force or whatever. And so we're seeing like this militarizing of Santa Claus. Santa Claus is being woven into the military and Santa Claus narratives are becoming slowly but surely militarized, right? And this, this takes us right back to the beginning of the lecture. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Right, Santa Claus is naturally internalizing a surveillance state. If you read this like that, and if you read what he's doing in these movies, like I would not be shocked if this is one of the directions that Santa, Santa and Christmas horror more broadly decide to go in in the future. Because these are real things to be concerned about, right? You know, we've got drone warfare now. We've got all of these like real world tensions that are mapping on to some of the kind of like extremities of Christmas horror. Oh, that was backwards. That's forward. <laughs> so I want to, I want to, I want to go out by asking you, what do you want for Christmas? Uh, just a fun little question for everyone to think about. Um, uh, but I'm not asking you what you want for Christmas. I'm asking you what you want for Christmas. So this isn't asking uh, what toys do you, if you want a Nintendo Switch, if you want the Animal Crossing Switch, you got to pay extra for Santa to get you that. Um, but I'm asking you what you want for your Christmas horror, what you want for this, this holiday season, whether, whether it's held religiously or not at all, or just as kind of like the cultural backdrop to winter, you know, like what do you want this space to become? Because as we've been talking about this whole time, you know, this is a folk tradition and we are the folk. We are the constitutive elements that get to decide what these mythologies become both inside and outside of the context of horror cinema. Um, and with that, uh, I just wanted to thank Sam for having me on. This has been so much fun and thank you all for showing up. <laughs>